All right, would you open your Bibles to the book of Daniel? We are going to do our Daniel seminar uh, this morning. And so we're going to look at some very interesting information. Now, if you have not been attending the seminar, um, you have been missing out. You have been missing out. So we're going to look at that this morning. Okay, the, uh, the topic for this morning is a, a very uh, important one, as the other ones are. But we have been, uh, for, the, for the last couple of nights, we've been looking at a particular element in Daniel chapter 7. So if you want to go to Daniel chapter 7, and uh, should I say that again? Daniel 7. Daniel 7. <laughs> Daniel 7. <laughs> Okay, maybe that was a code word for the lights. We've been looking at this interesting issue in Daniel 7. Um, the prophet Daniel uh, has a vision in 7, and there is a particular part of this vision that really intrigues him and catches his attention. <laughs> and these lights are catching my attention. Let's just turn them off. Let's just turn the lights off. I'm going to come down here because it's too dark up here with the lights off. All right, we'll do that. Give me a second so I can get set up here. So what Daniel sees in chapters, in the vision of chapter 7, um, what really catches his eye is this, a very peculiar power that is symbolized by a horn. It has small beginnings, so it doesn't stay little. In fact, that's an important part to mention um, because we always say little horn in seminars like this. Well, don't think of a little horn that it's always little compared to the rest. What the language means is that it starts from small beginnings. It starts out small, <laughs> And then it gets huge. And the things that this little horn power says, remember the little horn is a symbol for a power, the things that it says and does surpass what the previous powers do. Surpass what the previous powers do. Um, Babylon, the Medes and the Persians, the Greeks, and even the Romans. That's why so much attention is given to this little horn power in chapter 7, and that's why Daniel is intrigued by it. Because uh, these beasts in Daniel 7, they're, you know, they're impressive. Uh, you know, multiple heads and et cetera, and et cetera, and bloody ribs in a bear's mouth, a lion with wings, et cetera. And you would think those things are, Daniel wants to know more about those, but he doesn't. He bypasses those and he says, I want to know more about this little horn because of its greatness and power that far exceed what the other beasts have done in history. So that's an important point to remember. So it starts out small, it grows, uh, starts out small and then just it grows. So before doing that, what we have been looking at we looked at yesterday, or Friday night, were God's commandments. We, re, we did a review of his commandments. And so what we're going to do today is, we're actually going into Daniel 7. I have some things that I, I want to share with you. And it has to do with um, our relationship with God, etc. So this is based on last night. I want you, I actually want to do this quiz. Just answer to yourself, and then we'll go over these again. This time it's multiple choice. So answer to yourself. God saves man by what? Works? Grace alone? Or grace plus works that man does? We'll go back to that. Question number two. How many plans of salvation does the Bible indicate there are? Two, seven, or one? Two, seven, or one? How many plans of salvation? The third one says the purpose of the Ten Commandments is to save people, to show people they need Jesus Christ, to let people know it's easy to get into heaven if they keep all commandments. So which one of those is the correct answer for you? Number four, how many times have the Ten Commandments 
Commandments been changed by God. Never have been and never will be. Once at the cross, not in Bible times, but God has authorized his church to do so. Well, that's a tricky one. So which one of those answers is correct? And then number five, what was the reason why Old Testament people were to obey God? Was it in order to be saved because they loved God or because they were afraid of God? That's the Old Testament, okay? So, let's go back to number one. God saves man by, which one did you answer? The letter is B, grace alone. Grace alone. God saves people by only his grace. Now, works do come into play as a response to that, but when God saves people, he's not going to look at all the good things that you've done. They just, they don't measure up. They just simply don't measure up. So it's only by his grace. Number two, how many plans of salvation does the Bible indicate there are? Yes, it's C. It's one. There's only one plan of salvation. It hasn't changed from Old Testament times to New Testament times. It's always been by grace. Always been by grace. Uh, sometimes that's a confusion nowadays. Number three, what is the purpose of the commandments? What, what say ye? What is the purpose? Okay, to show people that they need Jesus Christ. Of course, because the Ten Commandments cannot change you. They can't fix you up. What we said last night, the Ten Commandments inform, but they do not transform. Only God's grace can transform. So the commandments aren't going to change. They just, they just show you what's who we are. They inform us the difference between right and wrong, what sin is, what it is not. It's information, but it has no changing power to it. Number four, how many times have the Ten Commandments been changed by God? Never once, or not in Bible times, but the church can do today. Which one? It's never. It's letter A. Okay? Um, it's letter A. That's, we're talking about the Ten Commandments. And uh, number five, what was the reason why Old Testament people were to obey God? Which one? It's letter B. Okay, it's letter B. All right, we're going to go, today's lesson, um, how the little horn changed God's law. We're going to go over a few things first. And um, which law was nailed to the cross? Which one? Commandment number one, commandment number eight, or commandment number three, or commandment number four. Okay, well, I'm not talking about a particular commandment. I'm talking about law in general. Okay, so we're going to look at that. You notice what I put here? This is, my, it's dark. This thing is really dark. Um, I don't know if you'll be able to, to see this or not, but can I do something really quick here? Let's change this to... Well, that's a little better, right? Okay, we'll change it to that one. That's a little better. Um, on the left-hand side are granite stones. On the right-hand side is what's called a manuscript, a piece of scroll that's written on in Greek or Hebrew. Okay, so which law was nailed? The moral law or the ceremonial law? Okay, ceremonial law. So we're going to look at this. The moral law is called the royal law. In James chapter 2, the ceremonial law is called the law contained in ordinances. Just lots of different details and, you know, um, don't do this to your neighbor. Um, don't treat foreigners that are within your gates this way. There's lots of different, different laws. Oh, well, those are sundry laws. The ceremonial laws are laws such as, um, you know, on Passover, this is the kind of animal you need to sacrifice. Um, when you, uh, you know, ceremonial laws. Okay, the moral law was spoken by God himself, right? In Deuteronomy 4, also in Exodus. Um, this is an interesting thing. Um, how many of you have seen the Charlton Heston movie, The Ten Commandments? I love that movie. I love that movie. Well, in that movie, it's not accurate. There's some things that are not It's a cool movie. I'd still love to see it. But it's not 100% accurate. Because when Moses gets the Ten Commandments, he goes up to Mount Sinai, and God is, thou shalt not kill. <laughs> you remember that, that scene? I love that scene. And he's receiving the, and then he goes down. That's not the way it happened. The way it happened on Mount Sinai was God came down on the mountain and there was thunder and smoke and, <laughs> and lightning and everybody saw it. Everybody saw it. Moses was down at the base of the mountain. 
And God just appeared with this amazing power that you were just shaking in your boots. And God spoke the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not kill <laughs> or murder. He spoke the commandments and everybody heard them. Then Moses went up and got them in writing. But that's how it really happened. Okay, so that's why it says it was spoken by God himself. The ceremonial law was spoken by Moses. God never spoke the ceremonial laws to the people. That's why Moses took a month and a half to be on the mountain, right? Because he had to write all this stuff down. That he was being dictated by God. Then Moses shared those things with the people once he came off of the mountain. The moral law was written by God on tables of stone with his own finger. The ceremonial law was the handwriting, the ordinances. Who wrote the ceremonial law? Moses did. He wrote it himself. So he had to take his ink horn and his quill and he had to take his supplies up there, right? The moral law was written with the finger of God. The ceremonial law was written by Moses in a book. The moral law was placed inside the Ark of the Covenant. Exodus 40, verse 20. The ceremonial law was placed outside next to it. Sort of just in a bag, you know, leaning against it. Uh, the moral law is perfect, right? Psalm 19, 7. Um, the ceremonial law has made nothing perfect. Hebrews is an amazing book uh, that uh, brings out the differences between these laws, between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. I mean, Hebrews is it. The moral law is to stand fast forever and ever. The ceremonial law in Colossians 2 was nailed to the cross, taking away the dividing uh, wall you know, and, and, and uh, nailing it to the cross and creating the perfect peace between the two, meaning the Jew and the non-Jew. Well, if you take away the Ten Commandments, how is that going to create peace between the two? If the commandments is all about love your neighbor as yourself, right? To the Jew and the non-Jew, um, non-Jewish people, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, uh, you know, Mesopotamians, they all believe that adultery was wrong. That's not something new that God came up with. They all had written on these steels and on their documents what would happen to you <laughs> if you did this. So it's not like these pagan societies were completely lawless, right? And so just imagine if a Jewish person comes along and says, guess what? Or a Christian comes along to, or in those days, in the ancient days, guess what? That commandment to not uh, commit adultery, that's been taken out of the way. Now we can have peace. They're going to say, well, not for us. <laughs> that may be for you guys, but we think it's wrong. <laughs> um, taking away the Ten Commandments and nailing to the cross does not create peace between people. Quite the opposite. It can create chaos. The moral law was not destroyed by Christ. What does Matthew 5.17 say? Jesus said this in, in, the, in, his, uh, in the beginning, in the Sermon on, In fact, those were after the Beatitudes. This is the first thing he said. After the Beatitudes, the first thing that Jesus said. Do not think, what? To destroy the law or the prophets. I have not come to destroy, but what? To fulfill them. So he's reminding them after saying, blessed are you, blessed are you. You know, Jesus sort of. You know, he's, he's giving his grace. You know, we're for you guys. God and I are for you. Blessed are you if you're poor in spirit or you feel you're destitute spiritually. You're blessed because at least you recognize your fallenness. Blessed are you if you're a peacemaker. You know, we love you guys. By the way, and he says, before all these other things, don't think I've come to destroy the law. Want to make that clear? We got that clear? Okay, let's get that out of the way and let's go on. <laughs> That's the Sermon on the Mount. That's the Sermon on the Mount. The ceremonial law was abolished by Christ. The moral law was to be magnified by Christ, Isaiah. The ceremonial law was taken out of the way by Christ because you don't need to kill animals anymore to have a special access to God. It's just not necessary. The moral law gives knowledge of sin. Paul says this in Romans 3 and Romans chapter 7. He says that the ceremonial law was instituted in consequence of sin. Without the moral law, um, you know, you may come up with your own laws or rules on what constitutes sin and what doesn't. Now, all of us are fallen beings. We're all sinful. 
I am not going to come to you and you're not going to come to me for a perfect, absolute, eternal law. It's not going to work. Because we're fallen creatures. We cannot come up with something that is perfect. In, in this context, in the sense of a moral law, ten comprehensive rules that are far-reaching. Because we're fallen. You need the law to be perfect, written by a perfect God. That's why sometimes we say God's law is a transcript of his character. It's who he is, right? If Les writes a love letter to Judy for Valentine's Day, and the things that you say, Judy's going to recognize, oh, that's my husband. If it's a fake and a phony and somebody else does it, a secret admirer, you know, this isn't the way Les talks, <laughs> right? So God's law, it reveals who God is. What God is like, right? Okay, what about the covenants? The old covenant and the new covenant. Here's some similarities between the two. Both were called covenants. Both were ratified by blood. Both were concerning the law of God. And both were made with the people of God. Both were established upon promises. Now here's the dissimilarities between the two. The one on the top is the old. The one on the bottom, there's Jesus. I think that comes from comes from the Passion, Mel Gibson's The Passion. Um, it's called the Old Covenant, it's called the First Covenant, and it's a temporary covenant. Talking about the one in the Old Testament times. The one that was ratified by Jesus with his blood, his sacrifice, is called the New One, the Second One, and an Everlasting One. Here's some more uh, dissimilarities. The Old Covenant was used, utilized by animals' blood, it was an inferior, faulty covenant. This is Hebrew, Hebrew, the book of Hebrews language. And it's based on types, a shadow of what was yet future. That's the old covenant. Okay? The new one is ratified by Jesus' blood himself. What's more valuable? What if your child dies? And your pet dies? Unless you're a morbid person and distorted in your thinking, you're going to mourn more for what? Your pet or for your child? Who are you going to mourn more for? What costs more funeral expenses? What are you going to miss more? What's going to affect you more? Losing a pet or losing your own child? So just saying that in itself, we know that Christ's blood is much better it's a better covenant. That's why it's called a better covenant. And it's based on an anti-type. The real and true has come. I've used this illustration before. Let's say my wife takes a trip and she's gone for six months. And so, uh, you know, I don't carry photos in my wallet. I don't like thick wallets. Some people have wallets that thick. I just can't do that. But, um, but anyway, so she's gone for six months and I decide to put a photo of, of, of her in there. Well, it kind of doesn't make sense with Skype and video talking, you know, so. But let's say that stuff didn't exist. And she's gone for six months. Talked to her on the phone, but, you know, I just look at that photo. And I look at it, and I can hardly wait till she comes back. Can hardly wait. Six months. I'm counting the weeks. I'm counting the days. And um, so I'm looking at that photo, and go to bed, and I look at that photo, and I kiss it. And I'm doing all these things, right? <laughs> and I put it on my pillow at night. Right? And some of you guys, I know what you're thinking right now. Oh, pastor's so romantic. I know. And then she comes back after six months. She comes back after six months. The next day when she comes back, I'm still kissing that photo and looking at that photo. Would I do that? Why? Because you're here. I can kiss the real thing. Instead of photo paper, now I've got flesh and blood, <laughs> right? So why would I need the photo anymore? Why would I need that? That's sort of like what the Old and New Covenant is. Why do you need animal's blood anymore? It was all symbolic, a type of what was to come. Now the real deal is here. So that's why we don't need to celebrate the feasts. Some people say, should we celebrate the feasts? For what? Paul says, everything in Jesus is yes. All the feasts find their fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Why are you still kissing that photo? Dummy. The real one has come. Um, 
The old one had imperfect human mediators. The priests were imperfect. Sins transferred to animals in the old one, and there were repeated sacrifices, right? Because it was all, if you're repeating something, it's imperfect. Someday we'll have a house in heaven, and it won't get worn out. My next door neighbors, they just painted their house a few weeks ago, but the guys had to fill in all the little cracks on the stucco and repaint it and everything. And guess what? If you haven't painted your house in 20, 25 years, guess what it looks like now? You don't even tell me what it looks like. I already know what it looks like after 25 years. The paint wears off, right? Well, it says here that the sacrifices were repeated. Why? Because they were imperfect. That's why you had to keep repeating it. That's why this remodeling, that's why you have to keep on doing over and over again. Because it's symbolic of something perfect that's going to come in the future. Jesus is a perfect heavenly mediator. Sins are transferred to Christ and his sacrifice was once for all. That's why don't get duped into thinking we still have to celebrate the feasts. Don't do that. Because <laughs> it's not needed. Um, only the high priest enters the most holy place. It's impossible for animal blood to take away sin. It's impossible. It was a symbol. You had to have faith that those symbols God will accept, of course. He's the one that started it. But in the new covenant, we enter the most holy place through Christ, and Christ removes our sins by his own blood. Amen? Amen. Oh, man. God said to them, if ye will do all, then ye shall be my people, and I will be your God. And God said about himself, I will do all, will be your God, and you shall be my people. So God will do everything for us. We, in turn, respond Okay, all right, so the commandment that helps establish a relationship, let's go to the little horn. What is it that the little horn power attempts to change? What does he attempt to change? Okay, he thinks to change times and laws. You know, what? now that I'm here, I might as well say this. I was going to save it for later. Um, times and laws, this is interesting. Um, I would love to just get a quadruple PhD in biblical scholars. <laughs> but uh, there's no time and money. So I leave it up to these guys. And it's interesting, if you look at Daniel 7, verse 25, so you have your Bibles there. Look at Daniel 7 and verse 25, and this is what it says. Daniel 7, verse 25. By the way, is this, uh, is this on? Is this on? Verse 25, he will speak out against the Most High. I'm going to dissect it into four parts. <clears throat> he will speak out against the Most High, part one. And wear down the saints of the highest one, part two. And he will intend to make alterations in times and in, and in law, part three. And they will be given into his hand, they meaning the saints, for a time, times, and half a time, part four. So this is what this scholar says. His name is Jacques Ducan. He was, in fact, he was my professor in, when I was in the seminary. He says that he shall speak against the words against the Most High and intend to change, change times in law. That's a reference both to God. The part where it says he shall persecute the saints of the Most High, that was part two that I read. And the saints shall be given to Sanford time times. That was part four. Those are connected. So you have part one and three connected and two and four connected. So if part three, change times and laws, is connected with he will speak blasphemous things against the Most High. Well, then changing times and laws is not just changing the clock. It's not just about I'm going to change the speed limit from 25 to 30. If it's connected to speaking words against the Most High, then times and laws is connected with God Himself. So it's not talking about just any time, and it's not just talking about any law. And the other thing this other scholar says, his name is Stefanovich, he says this, the Semitic noun zimnin, which means set times, the times, it's zimnin, is used in the Old Testament for the important days in the Hebrew calendar. That's times. And then there's verses here that he uses to back it up. 
The second noun, dot, which is law, dot, is in the singular. So the times is plural, that is in the singular and should be considered the Aramaic equivalent to the Hebrew word Torah. So the law, the equivalent of that Semitic noun, the equivalent in Aramaic would be Torah. So he says these two nouns are placed next to each other in order to express a single concept. Concept. Therefore, the whole expression means the set times regulated by the law. It's interesting. The set times regulated by the law. And of course, it includes the seventh day Sabbath. The book of Daniel teaches that God is the only one who changes the uh, times and the seasons. So to change for this horn, to pretend to change times and law, it's talking about God's law itself, not just a speed limit. Let's go to number two. Which of the Ten Commandments in the law deals with time? Which one? <clears throat> it's the fourth one, of course. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Let's go to, now we're going to talk about the seventh day now, so let's do a little, uh, a short study on this one. The seventh day. Okay, which day has God specified to be set aside as a special day in which God and his people have a, can build a solid relationship together? Which one is that? That's the seventh day. So originally in Genesis, the seventh day was a day that God had established and that God had practiced. In Genesis chapter 3, those first three verses, God established the seventh day as a Sabbath. He ceased to work, not because he was exhausted, but just because he stopped. And he said, this period of time, this 24-hour period, I'm going to set it apart from the rest of the weeks, days of the week. Not set it apart and detach it from the week, but set apart in its significance and in its status. There's a scholar by the name of Abraham Heschel that calls it a palace in time. That's what he calls the Sabbath, a palace in time. And so God established in the beginning. Now some will say, yeah, but where does it say that Adam and Eve kept the Sabbath on that day? It doesn't say it. It doesn't say that Adam and Eve kept it. But the interesting thing is when you get to the commandments <coughs> um, that God wrote for Moses, for his people, it says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And then he reverts back to creation. For God created the world in six days, therefore rest. You may think, wait a minute, he didn't tell Adam and Eve to rest. But in Exodus 20, he's telling them to rest. But why is he telling them to rest? Because of the example that he gave way back in the beginning, and he says the word remember. And the Sabbath commandment existed before Exodus 20, by the way. Just go four chapters earlier to Exodus chapter 16. Let's move on. Which day is the seventh day? It is Saturday. Um, to discover which is the seventh day, one only has to take a quick look at the calendar. This may confuse you. How many of you have calendars that start the week with Monday? Raise your hands. Okay. There's a lot of them out there. Yeah. There's some calendars out there that start with Monday. And so I have been asked, well, I don't know. I, I'm confused, Pastor. I've literally been told this. I'm confused because the seventh day is Sunday. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It's the seventh day. I said, no, that's just for purposes of that the weekend is a week's end. <laughs> that's the way I see it. It's the literally the weekend, Saturday and, Saturday and Sunday, if you use that calendar. Uh, but then I say to them, well, which day did Jesus resurrect? And what's the answer? Well, then why don't you keep Monday? I just simply say that. If Monday is the first day of the week, then Jesus resurrected on Monday. Therefore, you should be keeping Monday holy and do all your church services on Monday. Well, no, but we do it on Sunday. That's because Sunday is the first day of the week. You know, so don't, don't let that confuse you too much. Okay, has there been any change in the calendar that has affected the weekly cycle? Yes or no? No, there hasn't. There's been a change in the calendar but it didn't change uh, the cycle. So this happened under Pope Gregory. We all use a Gregorian calendar today. There used to be a uh, Julian calendar under Julius, 
And by the time Pope Gregory comes along, you know, the days were just out of sync throughout the year. Everything was out of sync. Um, in fact, we're still out of sync. Every four years we have what? A leap year. We're still out of sync by just seconds that turn into minutes. And by the time we come to the fourth year, we add an extra what? Day to the month of February. We have to add an extra 24 hours to kind of catch up, right? And so this has been an issue all along in mankind and calendars, but here's the change that took place in 1582, right? Notice this. This is October 1582. You have Sunday through Saturday. You see the dates? They're all in sequence, correct? Check this out. Oops, I thought I had it here. It's not there. Okay, what happened was, what ha oh, there, I'm sorry, it is there. <laughs> Thank you, John. It is there. So because uh, Pope Gregory and his mathematicians and uh, astronomers and all, and they did it right, they were correct. You know what, we're out of sync by, what's that, 11 days. We're out of sync by 11 days. So all they did was, okay, tomorrow is the 15th. Now they didn't say when it was Thursday, tomorrow is Saturday. The sequence of the days remain. The only thing that changed was the number, right? So all of a sudden you lost 11 days in number, but not in actual days. They just changed the number. Okay. They had to catch up. Okay. So that's what happened there. Oh, yes. You're jumping ahead of me. You're stealing my thunder, Ricky. <laughs> Sorry. You're talking about the Sabbath, right? Yeah, we'll get to that. <laughs> Give big, Ricky a big amen. amen. Because she is ahead of the game, so you deserve an A+. <laughs> okay, um, here's interesting. It's the same day today. Uh, just what I just uh, described. We do not change that week to be whatever it says up there. <laughs> okay, I wanted to get to this. Um, there was a letter written by the Seventh-day Adventist Church by F.D. Nickel in 1932. And F.D. Nickel writes this letter and saying, hey, you know, has there been a change? He writes it to NASA in Washington, D.C. Or, excuse me, the Navy Department, U.S. Naval, and this is what it says. We have an occasion to investigate the results of the works of specialists in chronology, and we have never found any of them that has ever had the slightest doubt about the continuity of the weekly cycle since long before the Christian era. This is what the Naval Department is saying. So, did the weekly cycle change since 1932? Of course it hasn't. Of course it hasn't. Goes on to say, there has been no change in our calendar in past centuries that has affected in any way the cycle of the week. So F.D. Nickel was an Adventist scholar and he, he wrote them a letter uh, I don't, not because he doubted it, but just wanted to get some secular confirmation of what we have believed all along. As far as I know, in the various changes, changes of the calendar, there has been no change in the seven-day rota of the week, which has come down from very early times. How early, guys? How early? Since creation. There's absolutely no logic behind a seven day cycle. There's no logic in the sense that it is not connected with the movements of nature. Zero. There is no logic to it. We go on a, you know, there's a, you know, a, a year cycle, there's a month cycle, but where do you get the weekly cycle from? Well, it's because the North Star is in that position every seven days. And I get super hungry for spaghetti every seven days, so that's got to be it. There's no, there's no reasoning behind it, except that God made it. Except that God made it. All right, question number six. What other evidences are there that the day of the week called Saturday is the same as the biblical Sabbath? Okay, Ricky, this is yours. This is yours. In 105 languages in use today, the word for Saturday has this as its root meaning Sabbath. Okay, in Ghana, how do you say Saturday in Ghanaian? How do you say it? Homeda? Homeda? That doesn't sound like Sabbath. 
But what does it what does it actually mean in that language? Does there do you know if there's a meaning to it? It means a resting day. It means a resting day. Okay, there you go. And the, in the language in Ghanaian, it means a rest day. Saturday does not mean rest day. What does Saturday mean? Saturday. The God of Saturn. Yeah. <laughs> Saturno. Um, our names in English are all pagan. Sunday, Martes, Tuesday is the moon. Because in Spanish, Martes, right? Martes is about the moon. Thursday is about Jupiter, if I'm not mistaken. So we have all the pagan names. What was that? Jueves, yeah, Thursday. Yep. Okay, here's uh, some of the languages. Sabatum, Sabaton, Sabota, Sabato, Sabado, Sabado. You see, Ricky, take a picture so you can get this. <laughs> okay. You know this already because you're an expert on this, right? <laughs> you know all of this. The history of the Jews who have consistently kept the Sabbath over the centuries indicates clearly which is the seventh day. Um, what further biblical evidence is there that the seventh day is Saturday? Jesus died on Good Friday, what we call Good Friday. The day that he died, why is it called Good Friday? My, 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 my guess is that the, it, that comes from uh, the Roman Catholic Church in the Middle Ages, why it's called Good Friday. But would you say that particular Friday is, was a Good Friday? No. Uh, I would say it was. I would say it was. Because Jesus decided to go to the cross. So, you know, that's probably why it's called Good Friday. The day that he died is called in Scripture the day before the Sabbath. That's what it's called. Uh, the next day was Sabbath. The disciples rested on the Sabbath day according to the commandment. You know, I know that because the book of Luke says the ladies on the resurrection, on, on the crucifixion day, which was the day of preparation, which was Friday, they went to prepare uh, spices and ointments and stuff like that to embalm his body. Well, the sun was setting and they were in a rush, you know, like yesterday. We were all in a rush. We didn't want to do any of that setup on the Sabbath hours. And we had to do a lot. We started Thursday and we started Friday. And I guarantee you, the things that we did out there was not done during the Sabbath hours. Uh, in fact, we said, oh, it's 10 minutes, 15 minutes for the Sabbath. Guys, we need to start cleaning up and, and stop. So we stopped. And then, of course, we had to make sure some of these rooms were adequate for Sabbath school classes, but we didn't do anything. And that's what the ladies did. They, the sun was setting. We got a rush, and they were rushed, and they were rushing. And, um, and they didn't have time. They didn't have time. And so they stopped what they were doing. Instead of 75 gallons or whatever, however, they, they used a lot. They only prepared so much. So the Bible says they went back home and they rested on the Sabbath day, and quoting verbatim, according to the commandment. That's verbatim. That's why the women went out early Sunday morning. Why? To, to, because they believe that Jesus resurrected? Do you believe the women thought that Jesus resurrected? Then why did they go to the tomb? To finish what they started on Friday night just before sundown. To finish what they started, even the disciples, they probably told them, you ladies are crazy. There's Roman guards over there. <laughs> the Roman guards are there. And all of the disciples were hiding for fear of the Jews. They all knew there was Roman guards at the tomb, except when Jesus resurrected, what happened to those guards? <laughs> they fell like, they didn't die, but they fell like dead men. And once they came to and, let's get out of here. <laughs> That's why there were no guards Sunday morning, because they took off. Because Jesus had already resurrected. And they were scared out of their boots. They probably forgot their shields and swords or something. I don't know. And so the women noticed that they were gone. Uh, letter C, following the Sabbath came Sunday. Jesus rose on Sunday, the first day of the week. By the way, the Bible doesn't call it Sunday, it just calls it the first day of the week. The Bible says that the day he rose was the day after the Sabbath. So look at those verses and you can check it out. All right. Who did Daniel declare would think to change the times in the law? Okay. The little horn guy. Okay. He thought to change the times and the law. Here's the origin of the Sabbath. Uh, I'm not going to do this, but there's an exhibit 
Um, some of you have received the lesson for today. You received it last night, but if you read this exhibit, uh, there's like five pages, six pages worth of stuff here. Um, it'll go over some of the things that were uh, changed. Um, there's just a lot of quotes here. And, um, you know, if you want some of this stuff, I'll make a copy for you. I won't give you the original ones because I want the original ones to stay with some of our leftover original lessons. So if you want some of this information, uh, just ask me and uh, I'll get it to you next week. <laughs> I'll get it to you next week. Okay, when did the Sabbath originate? No, when? Originally, originally. At creation. That's why I put this picture for you guys. Give you a hint. Okay, the earth. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and he rested and hallowed it. He rested and sanctified and hallowed it. How many of you have special coins at home? Anybody have any coins or stamps? I have a 1943 penny, but it's not steel. <laughs> but some of the coins that I have at home um, are special coins. Do you think I put it in our little piggy bank? We have a piggy bank. It's the form of a church that we use with, with pure quarters. And once we fill it with, with quarters, we bring it to church and it's for the building fund. And do uh, you think I keep those coins in there? I have it separate in a little bag, right? That's what God did. Well, this day is different. This day is different. It's a celebration of what I did for you, for this universe, a brand new planet, spanking new right off of my assembly line hands. And I want everybody to remember that I did this. I did it. And so that's what the Sabbath reminds us of. God did this. It's a powerful reminder that God is our creator and our friend and our redeemer. We'll take the Sabbath out and replace it with another day that you want. You're, you're, you're skewing it. I have a computer program at home. It's called Illustrator. And I can just draw a box and there's a button and it says skew. Distort. Transform. Skew. And I can just take my click and the box will go Rooch! Well, you can say it's still a box, but you're going to say it's a skewed box. Well, that's what people have done. They've skewed it. Oh, yeah, they still mention Jesus and God. Big deal. That's easy to do, but they skewed it. So, John, when's your birthday? October 18? Forget October 18. Let's celebrate it on March 5th. Okay, that'd be cool with you. Everybody, John's new birthday is March 5. Just remember March 5. I'm not going to even tell you <laughs> March 5. Let's celebrate his birthday on March 5. Would you agree with that? Go to Denny's. <laughs> <laughs> no matter how hard I try, I cannot change the date of his birth. No matter how hard I try. Right? I can come up with some dates and celebrate as much as I want. But the fact of the matter is, you were never born on that day. Same thing with the Sabbath. Um, it was at creation. What, with what word does God begin the Sabbath commandment? Remember. 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 God chose it to begin the Sabbath commandment because it denotes three possibilities. Number one. You cannot remember something you have never heard of before. Therefore, the origin of the Sabbath must have been before Sinai and not at Sinai. Right? If I tell you guys, I want you to raise your hands. How many of you remember our 65th anniversary of the church when the mayor was here? Raise your hand. You remember that? How many of you don't remember that? How many of you don't? Mary, how come you don't remember it? Because you weren't here. You weren't here. So how can I say, Mary... Oh, shame on you for not remembering. Shame on you for not remembering. Would I be justified in talking to her like that? She wasn't here. So when God says remember, he's justified in using that word because you were there. Because you know he's referring to something that you know about before Exodus chapter 20. 
The second one says here, the word remember signifies that a person should pay special attention. Honey, remember my birthday on July 11. <laughs> Please remember my birthday on July 11. <laughs> okay. Remember, I want that Dodge Ram. Okay. <laughs> and the letter C says, the word remember indicates that God looked down the stream of history and saw that this would be the one commandment that the world would forget. God knows what's going on. He's, he's on point with everything. He knows what's going on. Number 11, what three things did God do when he instituted the Sabbath at creation? He did three things. Abstract things. He didn't create something. Yes, okay, here's the three things. God rested, blessed, and sanctified it. However he does that, which we don't know. He didn't make a tree, a monument. He just blessed it. He rested and blessed it and made it holy. So we don't know how he made it holy, except that it was a declaration he made it holy, right? So it's, in fact, let me backtrack. So the Sabbath, this 24-hour period that we're living in right now, there's nothing special about the time itself in a very literalistic, logical way. Do you feel anything in the air right now? Are the hairs in the back of your neck standing up? Do you feel like your heart beating because you're in this particular 24 hour period? Do you feel different? Do you actually physically, physi physiologically feel different right now? No. But the fact that God declared this time different and special, you have to remind yourself and almost force yourself in some cases this time is special. Why? Why is it special to you? It's not because you're not hungry. It's not because you can run 50 miles on this day and not get tired. It's because God declared it. That's what makes it special. And that's where we forget more often than not. We have to re be reminded by God that this is a special time. But in, phys in, in physics, in the realm of physics, this 24-hour period is the same as any other 24-hour period. Except that God had did something abstract and he declared it, it's special. So that's why we believe it's special. Did the Sabbath exist before sin or only after sin? Well, it existed before sin. There were two institutions given to the human race in Eden. Can you take a guess? That's right. One was the Sabbath. That actually came as number two, so in the future I'll switch these two. The other one was marriage, was marriage, right? So marriage and Sabbath are very special things. The very foundation of human society and the procreation of the race and having little pieces of heaven here on earth is through this marriage relationship. You can be single and still experience God, but you can't procreate and continue the race. So marriage is the very foundation of humanity, the very foundation, the family. The Sabbath is the very foundation to remind us who made the family and marriage, and of course the world and us and everything. These are two very, very foundational, and fundamental, things. Very, very fundamental. Both of them have been messed with. Both of them have been broken. So nowadays we try our best to keep both of them as best as we can. Sometimes we need sermons like this. Sometimes we need better communication at home. Sometimes there may be counselors that may be needed. I get all of that stuff. But these two things the devil has sought to destroy to his utmost. The Sabbath was given before sin entered the world, hence it could not be altered by the cross. Did you pick that up? Did Adam and Eve sin on the very first day that they were created, which was Friday? No, and that's when God made the Sabbath. So the Sabbath has nothing to do with being abolished on the cross because of the grace of Jesus, because he's dealing with sin. Sabbath, that's why in Colossians 2 it says, uh, God put on the cross things of shadow, the shadow of things to come. 
The Sabbath was never a shadow of something that was coming through the Messiah. No, the Sabbath pointed backwards to the way the world was before sin and the cross was even necessary, right? Number 13, was the Sabbath given for the Jews only? Jesus says the Sabbath was made for man. So if you want to be a real man, keep the Sabbath. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> you want to be a real man, dude? Keep the Sabbath. Because the Sabbath was made for man. <laughs> no, the word obviously means mankind, humanity. All right, the perpetuity of the Sabbath. I'm speeding up here on question 14. We're almost done. We're almost done. Will the human race still keep the Sabbath in the new earth? Yes. Isaiah, are you sure? Yes. Isaiah 66. Here's the interesting thing. I'm going to give you some bonus material here. Um, you know, we all say we hope we can go to heaven, you know, when we die and not immediately after death. That's another lesson. But we all, all of our wishes for us and our children to go to heaven, right? Well, the, the real wish we should be making is we want to go to the new earth. Because in comparison to all eternity, we are in heaven for about 10 seconds. Just about 10 seconds compared to eternity. Because Revelation 20 teaches that we will be in heaven for how long? A thousand years. What is a thousand years compared to eternity? It's like I get an eyedropper. And I go out to the middle of the ocean and I drop that little drop in the Pacific Ocean. The Pacific Ocean is the new earth. So what? Is, so heaven has a specific purpose that we're going to be doing, um, according to Revelation 20. After it's over, oh man, this is, don't get me on this one. I will never be able to fathom how God will close shop on heaven. He will literally just close shop. He's going to rip up that lease. He's going to close shop, board up the windows, and heaven will be vacated forever. Because the Bible says that God is going to live right here on this soil that I'm standing on. Amen. Now that, try and wrap your mind around that. Why would God do that? I mean, his heaven has existed for all eternity. It's never had a beginning. Heaven, we're talking about heaven itself. And then after the thousand years, all right, start packing up, angels. Where did I put that box? Everybody packs up, leaves heaven, and God makes his dwelling place here on earth. Now, maybe the angels will live in heaven. So that could be a consideration. But God won't. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Will we keep the Sabbath and the new earth? It says, from one Sabbath to another, all flesh will come and worship before me, saith the Lord. This is in the new earth in Isaiah 66. Of what is the Sabbath a sign? It is a sign between the believer and God that they might know that I am the Lord that God that uh, the Lord God that sanctify them. That was in Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse. 12. That is a sign. Um, and two more. Of what else is the Sabbath a sign? According to Ezekiel 20, 20. What else? It's a sign that we don't go to the football game across the street, right? <clears throat> it is a sign that you may know that I am the Lord your God. Now, I'm not saying that those who do not keep Saturday as the seventh day do not know God. That's not what this lesson is inferring, and that's not what I'm saying. So don't go leave those doors and you go by, you know, the Mormon church or the Grace Community Church over here or the Hillel Center or the Church on the Mill, Church on Mill right here, the Baptist Church, and they really don't know God. Don't jump to that. Very, very false conclusion. Because there are Seventh-day Adventists that don't know God. Truth be told. There are Sabbath keepers 
that you really wonder if they have a relationship with Jesus Christ. By the way they talk, by the way they behave, their rudeness. And they worship God and sing those songs, but they'll treat you rude and mean and nasty. I have to conclude, I mean, which Jesus do you have in your heart? Can't be the Jesus of the Bible. And so don't jump to that conclusion. Do not jump to that conclusion, okay? In the future society, um, Sabbath and Sunday, which is really the true day of worship, that's going to come to the forefront in politics, <clears throat> and it's going to be an issue. Um, and you're going, to make, you're going to have to draw the line and make your choice. You're going to have to draw that red line, <laughs> like Obama said. You draw, you come across that red line, we're going to do something to you, Syria. Um, well, if society, a politician or a religious leader ever draws a red line for you and says, if you cross that red line because you keep the Sabbath, and if you cross it, we're going to persecute you and make all kinds of threats, then you have to cross that red line. Well, we're Sabbath keepers, right? There's a lot of people in the whole world that love Jesus with all of their hearts. All of their hearts. My wife was just, on the way here, she was just telling me about one of her patients. Beautiful, she says. She's such a beautiful Christian. Isn't that what you told me? She is such a beautiful Christian, one of the elderly. Hi, I'm your pastor. Oh, come, 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 let's sit. Come and sit. Let's pray. Oh, I look at the photo of my husband. He's passed away. I look at that photo. Reminds me, oh, I got to keep up my prayers. I got to make them strong, right? This sweet old lady. My wife says, beautiful Christian woman. She's not a member of my church. Do we doubt that she's a Christian? Of course not. Of course not. So anyways, don't come away with that conclusion. All right, which is the Lord's Day, uh, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> we got to close. Do you desire to build a better relationship with God through regular Sabbath keeping? Amen? Amen. Amen. I do too. If it was clear to you from this lesson that the Bible, Seventh day is Saturday, then say amen. amen. If it's your desire to deepen your relationship with God through ba daily Bible study and prayer and weekly Sabbath keeping, say amen. Okay, so the next lesson on Tuesday night, did God authorize the little horn to change the Sabbath? And here's a reason for that question. Because... Um, there is this belief that the Bible itself has authorized the Christian church to change God's law. Now, it makes sense if you believe that. If we are the church of God, and God has given us authority in His Word to change His laws, well, then you probably come away believing in those changes if God gave that power to the church, right? So that's why I said in another evening of our seminar, the Sabbath and Sunday thing, it's a very important issue, but the underlying issue, the underlying issue is whether the Bible can be changed or not. If you believe the Bible can be altered by man, well then you are in danger of going with this or that, depending on what a church says. But if you don't, then the Sabbath doctrine, teaching, is pinned down by this fundamental teaching that the Bible cannot change. Because God doesn't change, right? Okay, so, let's all sing our closing hymn, and then we'll have a word of prayer afterwards.